Hey everyone, thanks for coming out this evening. Um, my name is Michael Slotik. I'm a writer, director, producer, as well as the New York consultant for SAG Indie, which is a uh, organization that helps low-budget independent filmmakers work with union talent. Uh, so we're here with the director and some of the cast. And uh, so, Peter Lavosi. Hello, Yay. thank you for coming. Director. <laughs> Asa Butterfield. Good evening. Alex Wolf. And Maude Apatow. Before we get much further, I want to point out that there was a, not a conversation had about what we were going to wear here. And it looks like Ace and Maude are going to the Oscars and me and Peter are the chauffeurs. We didn't, we didn't plan it out. We, didn't, we went a little more casual. We didn't discuss it. Um, they look great. We don't, but all right, carry on. Yeah. I so feel good, good, actually, in what I'm wearing, Alex, so... So they decided to upstage you. That's that's for the best, you know. Why not? Um, so uh, let's start at the very beginning. Where where did this? How did you come to this project, or how did this project come to you? Because it's based on a book, right? Yeah. Um, uh, I went to film school, into the American Film Institute, and a guy I went to school with went to college uh, with the author of the novel on, on the House of Tomorrow, and. Um, he read the book and sent it to me and said, I think this would be a, a cool movie for us to go to go make. And I read it. And I really immediately just fell in love with all the characters. They were so clearly drawn and um, was excited to, to dig in from there. Um, but the movie didn't really start coming together until Ellen Burstyn uh, came on. And she, she was on the project about... Probably, I had been working on the script for a couple of years, and I sent her the script. And um, my agent, a couple weeks later, uh, she was just like one of the best. She's just one of the best actors. So I thought, why not start there and see what happens? And um, I got an email saying, "Did you know that Ellen was friends with Buckminster Fuller?" Which I did not know. Um, and had I read her memoir, I w she talks about it in there, which I did read before we started working together. But um, yeah, so Ellen read the script and said, uh, we both felt like it was something, it was like the easiest sell to get her onto the movie. She's like, she, you know, she was like, it was magic. So, so you met. didn't just pretend, like, oh yeah, sure, I knew that. That's why no, I sent it to her. No, I was, you know, thought I'd start things on an honest, on an honest plane with her. And yeah, and she showed me this. I went to her apartment uh, a couple weeks after getting that information, and she showed me that footage that you saw in kind of one of the last scenes of the film. And up until that point, I'd written like documentary footage that put those two characters in the same place at the same time, but never in the same shot together. And so, so it was, that was real. That's real. Oh, I was going to ask you how you did it. Well, it's oh. it's completely real, and well, there's about three hours more of it. So wow. it's kind of crazy, and it's never been released until this film. Fascinating. It all started from there. So it's kismet. Um, now, how did the rest of you guys, if you want to go down the line, how did you come to the film? How did the film come to you? What what was the process? Um, I got sent, well, we filmed this almost two years ago now, and I think I only got sent the script about two or three weeks before I, we even started shooting. I remember it happening really quickly, and, uh, and the shoot itself was 18 days, which was the fastest I've ever made a movie. I think any, any of us have made a movie. Um, and uh, yeah, it really was a case of everyone... Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, it was a case of every, everything kind of just coming together and all the stars aligning. Oh, it's going all the way down. I see. There we go. We're good. Um, yeah, it, it, it was a, a stroke of luck, I think, for all of us. So that you were literally, all... you, were, you were sent the script and you, you were in production like a couple weeks later or so? I, I, as far as I can remember, yeah. I'm pretty sure it was. I sent off a tape and pretty quickly... It was, it was tight. I don't remember if it was exactly that... I don't think it was as tight as you might remember it but it was ve it was very quick because we um i think we didn't have everyone on board in t and that was some uh, really fun for me um we didn't have everyone on board until maybe uh three weeks before camera was rolling two and a half weeks but it was a process we, we had we kind of had like okay here's who i really want for this and luckily i didn't have to go to the to the backups, so that was good. Alex, dude, how did how did you come to this project? Um, yeah, I just auditioned for it. I um, 
I read the script and I really loved it and I auditioned for it and I had to do it fairly quickly because I remember I was I had to do a graduation party. I was like I was graduating high school and I had to go to a graduation party and I just had to put myself on tape really quickly before I left and I had to because it had to be in by tomorrow or something like the day after. And so I remember I was like I was like oh well I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna get this one but you know I loved it and it's too bad and then I just kind of set in the tape and. Um, and then we talked about it and I found out that Maude was in it. I've known Maude since I was like 10 or 11 or since I was really young because our parents knew each other. And, um, and then I've just been a fan of Aces for forever. Um, I'm not just saying that because I'm in love with him, but also because <laughs> I'm just uh, was a big fan. So. so you took it because you were stalking him? That's why you took the part? Yeah, because I was stalking him and <laughs> yeah, exactly. I got a lot of weird emails from Alex leading up to the <laughs> leading up to making the movie, um, and then I, then we actually became real friends. Yeah, real friends. You actually emailed him? No, of course oh. not. <laughs> he, he did. He did Facetime me. <laughs> I did Just, Facetime you. Did, uh, very uh, early. Well, you were you were on on the toilet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was early on. I was trying to break this him in, so I called him while I was the on ice. the toilet. Um, yeah. Thanks, this is what you're gonna get basically yeah. for the next few I weeks. Feel like, I feel like ever we should all know. It's 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 the start of this. It was the start of this yeah. very intimate friendship. Yeah. All right. So, Maude, I want answer the same question, but also tell us how you dealt with these two guys on set. Um, I auditioned for it also. I sent in a tape, but yeah. it wasn't like Alex. I worked on it for like hours and hours and hours. <laughs> It was like the hardest day of my life. I don't know, it wasn't. It was just really, really long. But anyways, uh, working with them, it's great. I've known Alex since I was really young, and like Ace is amazing, and we had the best time because we were in rural Minnesota, and it was just us. And so we all became like best friends. We, we were all together yeah, all the time. It was so fun, and it was so fast and intense, and we sort of like got so close so quickly. Like Nick Offerman, like we all went swimming in the pool. Yeah, one we night went to the hot tub together. Like, that was fun. It was. It was. Like, um, Why didn't know, you guys call me for that? That sounds really fun. <laughs> My experience was so different. <laughs> As well, it should be. Yeah. So now, in terms of auditioning on tape, any, any, because a lot of the folks here, most of the folks are probably are, are union members or actors or filmmakers or both. Uh, talk about auditioning on, on tape versus auditioning in person or both. I mean, don't do it if you can help it. I mean, it's I, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend it. It's it's hard, but but when you're in New York, you have to do it a lot. But sometimes it's, I mean, I guess because there's benefits. There's benefits and there's I mean because you can you can control your performance more in a tape. You can do take and watch it and see if it's good or bad, and you can do different times and you can be really terrible and not feel bad about it. Just kind of get it out and get warmed up. But something about being in the room it can raise the stakes a little bit. Um, so do you worry know. about the lighting? Do you do it in your bathroom on the toilet like you did with... Um, <laughs> fucking Asa. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you worry about the li uh, lighting. But what, what about you? What do you think about auditioning on tape? You live in London, so you got to do it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I pretty much only send off tapes now. Like, very rarely am I, have I, do I go into a room for an audition. But it is nice to have someone there to give you feedback or direction because often when you're doing a tape... You go in pretty blind. Like even for this movie, I I just had the the scenes that were sent, the audition scenes, and um, often you just go with your gut, and that might be right as it was in this, but you may be way off, and there's no way of knowing that unless you've got someone to tell you that. So it's as Alex said, there's negatives and uh, and positives to both ways. I think though, from just from my side of it, looking at people on tape. Um, I think if I was if if I had the luxury of more time and money to do a, a, like flying people across the country to come and sit in a room, that would give me at least peace of mind that okay they could take direction or something like make adjustments. But I do kind of think you almost know if someone's right when they walk in and say, I mean, you're you're a director as well. Don't, I, don't you feel like it's it's almost something that has to come into casting and see it? I don't know that, and I do a lot of commercials as well and. I'll see hundreds of people on tape first and then do a callback where it's whittled down to 25 and then you give them feedback. And oftentimes I can tell from the tape, okay, this is going to be the person and you go through the process and sometimes sometimes I'm wrong, but well, also a lot of you times had it me, is that person. You had me send in a video of me playing music too. That was, that was the well, thing. Well, that, that was the thing for me with you that sealed it because you, your performance was great and, and then to everyone else, everyone for the role, role of Jared, I had to know, could this person play music because that was really important for the character we didn't have time to teach someone it, it needed to be something that was real 
And I gave everyone time to send me that. And some people were not musicians, but punk is something that you can kind of fake your way through a little bit. Alex didn't fake his way through it. He, he's a great musician and sent me something instead of the next day or two days later, he sent me something 20 minutes later that blew everyone else out of the water. And so it was just like, okay, we need to get this guy's deal figured out now, please. So Speaking of the music, who, who wrote the music and, and you guys performed all of it? or We did all of it live. That's something I want to make very clear. I taught Ace of Bass when we got there. Yeah. And we had like you know only the time during the movie to rehearse. Um, and then we played a concert. We found a gig in Minnesota to play live, and we rewrote with like three a real, songs like with a, a real at a real like a grungy bar in St. Paul. Exactly, with a live St. Paul, and we played. And Maud came, and like some people, locals came, and we did a real rock concert. And Ace and I learned five songs. We wrote three, and we just did these punk songs, and we we did a show for. And then all the music in the movie, like nothing, is with a click track. Nothing is. Um, you know, any playback, any of that, that was all me and Ace alive. That's great. That's great. The songs were, the lyrics to the songs were written by Peter Bagnani, the novelist, oh. slightly adapted for the film, and the uh, music arrangement was done by Mac McCona, who who's, um, was in Super Chunk, and oh, really? then um, these guys did their riff on that in the film. And did, um, did the, uh, did the, from book to shooting, well, to, from book to scripting to shooting to editing, how was there a lot of, a lot of difference, or is it very similar to the book, very similar to what you shot? Did it change a lot in the edit? How how did it go? Um, we were talking about this earlier today about the, the book. You couldn't make the book into a movie. The whole book is written in Ace's in Sebastian's voice, um, and I really early on decided I didn't want a, like a narration carrying through the whole thing. Um, so it was about taking a, a novel and finding a way to tell that story in, you know, 90-ish minutes. So it involved cutting some stuff and inventing some stuff and finding ways to turn internal thought into behavior, um, something an actor could play. And and also turning as much into a visual as I could. Um, and that's something the book didn't get to do. It didn't get to have domes. It didn't let you get to see all the depth of Bucky's imagination. Um, because it's all just talked about versus visualized, um, and I think, and then I think as far as specific things uh, in the book, it was a single mom that was raising Jared and Meredith, not a single dad. Um, but when I started paring that character down in the script, it it started to feel like something I'd seen a lot. I'd seen like Catherine Keener do that role three times, and that's who I would want to play that role. But she, there's no way she would do that because why would you do it? You said something you've done, but uh, so I, I just did a draft of the script where I turned all the she's into he and turned Janice into Alan and suddenly I had a dad with maternal instincts and it was a lot more interesting to me and then when we brought Nick on to play that it became a whole lot more interesting. Now is there going to be a, a rash reunion and will Maude be on the drums? Absolutely. It's an animated yes. uh, Saturday morning cartoon. <laughs> ah. Yeah, we'll do it. Now it's right, Mon? Um Now, for the three of you guys, uh, for the, you've all been acting since you were, were kids. You were little, right? Um, has it, is it totally different for you now? Has it changed a lot? What's, what's the process like for you now versus when you started out? Um, I think when you were a kid as an actor, like, for me, when I was, like, 10 or 11 working on a film set, you don't really think about acting. It's just something that comes kind of naturally and you just kind of go with it and you believe it and um, you don't really have to put too much thought into it. So as you get older, I think it actually gets harder because you start like so doubting great. yourself and you start being self-conscious and you're wondering if you're doing it right. And, and, and but as well as that, you do learn a lot more about how how to kind of understand the character and and, and it, it does become more complicated um, but it's yeah it's it's strange definitely I completely agree I feel the same way I, like I feel like 90% of my like process during actors trying to get back to what I was thinking when I was a kid which is yeah what I said absolutely nothing and just all it's all instinct and feeling and there's things that are, they hurt your feelings when they're happening and it doesn't matter that there's a camera on. It's just so immediate and so visceral. And, and so I feel like I just try so hard to get back to what it was when I was a kid. Just And yeah, what about you? I th 
You kind of just said it perfectly. I don't Say know. it again. Why not? <laughs> oh, no, no, but I, I completely agree with that. <laughs> so, and I mean, what about pressures of social media as an actor now? Does does that affect you? And also, I noticed there's no there's no reference to any like cell phones or I mean, this is a, a here and now film, right? So, was that a conscious decision? And and how do you? It was conscious because I just think they're kind of. I don't. I don't love that they even exist in the first place. In my life, I don't like what it does to me in my life. I don't. I, I don't really. And so, if I'm making a movie, I and I also think phone conversations are kind of boring and hard to shoot and hard to make dramatic. And I'd rather just have people talking to each other. Um, and certainly, that whole texting on screen thing has kind of been. I just. I don't know. I didn't see a need for it, so it was not in there. Um, talk about Nick Offerman. How did he come to the project, and and uh, how is it working with him? I'll say how he came, and then you guys can talk about how it was working. I mean, he was great to work with. But um, Nick came to the project because Ellen Burstyn, who's also an exact producer on our movie, um, was having Christmas dinner with... She was old friends with Nick's wife, Megan Mullally, um, and uh, they had done a TV series together. And Ellen approached... She asked me what I thought about Nick for the, the role once I turned it into a dad, and I said, that's a great idea. Yes, great. And she asked him at Christmas dinner if he would read the script, and he read the script, and he liked it, and then we got on the phone, and that was, he was in. So, yeah. Yeah, sorry. It's not more interesting than that. And then uh, working with him for me was a blast. How is it in a scene with him? Because Maude had a lot of, you had some, some scenes with him, and Maude, Alex obviously had I, some too, but. I mean, I've always loved him so much, so I was so excited. And he's just, like, he really made, like, I don't know, all, all of us laugh all day long. He's, like, really the funniest person ever. And he was so sweet. And, like, for me, too, like, I was really nervous. And he made me feel very comfortable. And he hung out with us after we wrapped. Like, he was, he really was, like, an amazing person and the funniest person ever. So, hey, so you've worked with a lot of, like, kind of legendary people at this point. So have you learned a lot? Is there anybody in particular that you learned a lot in terms of acting chops from? Anybody that passed on some deep knowledge or... Um, <laughs> hmm. I mean, well, yes. Uh, of course, I've learned... You learn things on, like, all the, all the jobs you do. and um... Mostly from me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I was asking kind of leading to you so yeah alex to <laughs> alex takes the cake on that on that regard um i mean i think let me uh, how do i answer this a piece of advice i was given um by emma thompson when i was working with her on, on, on nanny mcphee she said to me and i kind of take this into <clears throat> like you can put this outside of acting just to your everyday life <laughs> um is that you shouldn't Stand up if you should if you can sit down, and don't sit down if you can lie down. <laughs> and it basically means to kind of take care of yourself and your body, especially as actors, because you this is your instrument. Ugh, I hate saying that, but um, you do have to like take care of yourself. And when you're tired, you need to make sure you have the the, the you need to yeah look after your body and I your mind. Less is more when you say that. It's not that. Um. Uh, no. Well, it could be, and, and and interpret it however you like. Yeah. You just took you, you took it as take a rest, and you took it as less was more. I thought too. I thought that was what I thought what Peter was thinking. Maybe that is what she meant. You've been and misinterpreting just thought, it. And I just thought, yeah, I am gonna lie down. You know what? You should call her and find out. I should. I should. Great. Really. I'm gonna take a nap. Oh, I'm doubting it myself. All these years, ten years. <laughs> Been taking so many naps since yeah. then, huh? <laughs> wow, you should wake up. So, uh, any happy accidents along the way? Anything that uh, that you did not expect? My favorite happy accident on this. I mean, the whole the whole movie feels like a happy accident to me. But the, um, I think the thing that that I really loved uh, for me, like a, a lot of movies, are involved like he or, or whether it's a short or a commercial, a lot of prep, a lot of heavy storyboarding, a lot of this like pre-visualizing things and then it's executing it. And the movie was very different for me. The movie, just because I wanted to change my process, I don't know why I'd want to do that on my first movie, but I just thought, why not? And uh, it was that I wasn't going to storyboard anything. I was going to show up on set and see how the actors were in the space. I wasn't going to necessarily block them the way I thought it. I was going to try to say less and see what they 
brought to it. And that's where the happy accidents happen. And my DP was on board with that. We're all making the same movie together. So as long as we we're on the same page about the story we were telling and how we were telling it, we were able to let these guys do their thing and work work off of that. And um, that was a big one of my favorite versions of that. It had nothing to do with shooting it, but just had to do with on, I think a week before the shoot, we had hired a, a, a someone to teach Asa the bass because he doesn't play, and Alex volunteered to do that. And I think once they started working together, outside of me just doing their own thing, we res I rescheduled the movie to put all the music scenes in order. So when you see Asa plucking a bass in the woods for the first time, that's basically the first day he had that in his hands. And then when you see them practicing a little and he's learning a little bit there, that was very early. And then the, the final night of the shoot was the the big performance. And listening to what they were doing and finding a way to work within that, I think, helped the film. So, and, and obviously, it was you said it was 18 days, so there was no rehearsal time, there was no, like, real... Really, I mean, we had, like, Asa, Asa and Ellen and I did a little rehearsal in a hotel, read, some, read through some scenes, talked, but I spoke to everyone individually a plenty, and they spoke to each other on their own, and I think it was just coming into it. They also nailed their auditions. We talked about the character before they came on to it, so I feel, felt confident in what they had to do, and they, they all did it. So we have a couple uh, audience questions that came in before the audience watched the movie. So uh, this is for Peter. Reflecting back on your high school experience, what was the most important lesson that you learned? Um, well, uh, oh, oh, hmm. <laughs> I can say that um, the thing that, I, what I could say is how I thought of my high school experience with making this movie was I was into movies in the way that these guys are into punk and playing shows. And I think having a creative outlet when you're struggling with whatever you're struggling with is really important. And having a friend to share that creative outlet with is even better. And um, for me, this movie was about a lot of things, but that was one of the, the, that was sort of the beating heart of it was that these guys were working their shit out together. Um, and not having to necessarily spend a lot of time talking and bitching and moaning to each other about what was messed up about their lives, but just doing it through what they were making together. Um, so, yeah, movies did that for me. And I was in high school when we shot it, so I had no time to reflect. <laughs> Anyone else want to take a stab at it? We just graduated, right? That was the summer after we graduated senior year. Right? Was, you guys really? I didn't have another year to go? Oh, yeah. right. Because it was my graduation when I... Yeah. Nice. All coming back. Getting my story straight. All coming back. <laughs> so there's another one for Peter. Uh, how do you decide what story idea to film? Is there a process of selection or an inspiration? Um, just, I think, from, I guess from a... I could say, talk about it from a book, too, because that, that involved a process of paring something down. Um, Knowing what your movie's about to you, picking the things that are the most inherently dramatic, cutting the stuff that is maybe interesting in a novel and full of quirk and character or whatever the, the things that you find kind of textural, I think in a movie just sit flat a lot of times unless there's actually something dramatic happening and um, trying to grab onto that stuff as much as possible. and cutting the rest. When you have to tell this story in 18 days, you have no choice but to just do do that. And I still think there were things in the movie in the process of editing that I could have done better in the shooting to, that could have whittled down further. But that's just, uh, that's for the next movie. It's always, that's why I just stop yeah. watching them at a certain stop. point. Exactly. Um, so just real briefly, what are you, where, what's next for each one of you? Let's start with Maude at the end. I'm in school right now, but um, I have a movie coming out later this year. I don't know when yet called Assassination Nation. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, I have uh, a movie called Hereditary coming out uh, June 8th, this A24 movie. It's pretty disturbing. Um, and I uh, have this movie, Dude, coming out on Netflix, uh, which comes out on the 20th, um, where I get shirtless again. Uh, I just directed and starred in a, my first feature movie, which is really cool. Um, and then my mom, who's actually in the audience, directed me and my brother in a movie, Polly Draper. Thank Very you. Very nice. 
So yeah. Cool. Um, <clears throat> I uh, what am I doing this year? Um, I've got a, I've got something coming out in the end at the end of the year. Uh, I, in the UK for sure. I don't know if it's coming out here. It's a British comedy horror. Um, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, kind of Shaun of the Dead meets Harry Potter kind oh, of nice. a thing. So that's exciting. <laughs> that's a um, lots of kind of uh, gore and, and, and blood and, uh, and stuff. And that was, that was a lot of fun. I shot that last year. And um, yeah, that's, that's exciting. It'll be, a, it'll be different to what I, what I usually do. So. Cool. Uh, Peter? Just writing something right now that hopefully will be the next the next thing that I go that I go make and directing commercials. Great. So tell us when this opens and where and what everybody needs to do now. April twenty seventh, uh, in LA, New York, and I think Miami and Sarah. Where else? <laughs> All right, those places. Um. New York is going to be at the Village <laughs> East, and. Um, it would be helpful if you if you enjoyed it to you know s say that to somebody you you know, or if you are on the phone, tweet it or go on IMDb and give us a good rating or whatever you whatever you do it. And thank you though for coming anyway, regardless. Appreciate it. Tell your friends.